Ayurveda provides a fascinating system to cook food therapeutically. And it gives you all the tools that you need to figure it out on your own. And that's what makes Ayurveda so unique as a system of health. So I want to welcome everyone to tonight's class on how to cook therapeutically. Uh, my name is John Immel. I'm the founder and director of Joyful Belly Ayurveda. I love food. I've always loved food. I started re designing my own recipes uh, since uh, second grade, and I continued uh, throughout my entire uh, childhood and adult life, uh, designing recipes and making food. Food is one of the ways I show people I love them. So I... I love to cook for people. I love to make them happy with food. And uh, I'll even share uh, a, a little secret with you. When I first learned about Ayurveda, I um, uh, rejected it. And uh, because I thought that it would cramp my style with food. Food was, I meant, remember, food was a way I expressed myself artistically. And I thought that, you know, these restrictive food lists that you hear about would, um, uh, would restrict my creativity, essentially. And, uh, and it wasn't until I kept hearing the word Ayurveda, so I learned a little bit more about it. And then I realized that no, Ayurveda is not a system of draconian rules or food lists or anything like that. But Ayurveda is an awareness of how food affects us. And so instead of uh, it looking like rules, it looked like knowledge and, and actually um, a light bulb went off uh, one day for me when I realized I could use Ayurveda's system of cooking to make more delicious meals, more tasty meals, and it actually improved uh, how I uh, design and compose recipe, uh, recipes. And so I'm excited to touch upon this subject tonight uh, because it's one that I find delightful very personally. And also, it's a wonderful way to introduce uh, the fundamental theories of Ayurveda and how Ayurveda works and really what Ayurveda is. Because many people think of Ayurveda as the doshas and the uh, vata, pitta, kapha, if you know what those mean. And I would say that doshas are a later development or they're a consequence or a result of the Ayurvedic way of thinking. I'm going to take us back to the roots of Ayurveda uh, and, um, and share how we even get to such a concept like dosha and, um, and how uh, Ayurveda is immediately practical and relevant for anyone who wants to cook for themselves. Uh, so, oh, here we go. That's a picture of me. Um, uh, you can see me on my video too, if you're watching. And... Uh, I want to mention that tonight's talk is sponsored by the Master Ayurvedic Digestion and Nutrition 500-Hour Certification Program. That's a program we offer once a year, every year in the first Tuesday of October. Um, it is a uh, program for people who want to go deep into their digestive health and deep into their understanding of how to use food as medicine. And that, that's a 500-hour certification program teaches you how to uh, offer uh, this Ayurvedic knowledge on a professional level. And, uh, and it's, it's such an exciting course. And it's really exciting for anyone who wants to uh, learn about food in a deep way. One of the uh, things that we'll teach you is how to understand the medicinal and pharmacological effects of food and herbs based on experience. If you ever ask yourself that question, well, how did herbalists 600 years ago find out that an herb was useful for preventing a heart attack or something along those lines? Well, uh, they did it experientially. They understood uh, from tasting herbs, from eating herbs and paying attention to their body, they understood the kinds of things that that herb was useful for or the kinds of properties of that herb. And they uh, created a system around it. And that's the system I want to share with you today so that you could be like an herbalist of a thousand years ago, not having those double blind control studies of uh, West, modern Western medicine, but having your own God-given five senses to navigate a complex uh, world, to navigate 
um, uh, what you see, the living, you know, living plants and, and, and food that you see in nature all around you and other tools from nature uh, to exert an influence on how your body functions. And that's what Ayurveda is a system of. It's a system of understanding how tools in your environment influence internal function. Um, and so it's an exciting uh, course that we offer once a year and um, also uh, giving everybody a special promotion that you can save $350 um, by enrolling in the course after you, if, if you've attended tonight's talk. And uh, also, I want to mention on that same vein that this coming uh, Monday, a week from today, we're going to have an intro to the course as well. Uh, so if you have questions about the course, you can come to that. And also, uh, you can uh, contact me if you have questions about the course anytime. Uh, my cell phone number is 828-785-8213. Um, and I will write that quickly in the chat box. And if you have uh, a, a question about the course, uh, you can text it to me and I'm happy to talk with you about it. And that's, uh, I'm, in U I'm in the US, so that's plus one before that if you're calling internationally. And I have WhatsApp if you, um, if you need. Uh, someone's asking me on the uh, cost of that course. It's $4,499 uh, for a one whole year of uh, immersion into Ayurveda, a fascinating year. And, uh, and so uh, if that uh, is something that you want to go deeper in or you want to uh, know more about in your life, uh, then tonight is a, um, I, you could say, a little sample of what's to come in that program. All right. So, um, so I want to start from the beginning. That I said that Ayurveda is experiential. And so I want to just take you for a minute um, through a body scan because that's so important before you sit down to cook therapeutically that you know what's going on internally. And so, uh, you know, you can get in a comfortable position and close your eyes and we're going to just do a walk through some basic areas of your body. Start with the top of your body. I always going to do top down and I always... Um, uh, work from the outside in, right? So just examine what, what it's like in the inter inside of your head for a minute, uh, the front of your head, uh, the, the back of your head. Now, you may be just getting off of work. You may have had a tough day. Um, so you might feel tension in the front area of the brain. Um, and then you can slowly take that back to the back of the head See if you have any feelings there. Consider the left and right of the head. Uh, then your eyes. How do your eyes feel? Is there any tension around your eyes? Are they stinging? Do they feel dry? How about the taste on your tongue? That's a really important sign that we're going to pay attention to anytime we're cooking. What is the taste on your tongue? The taste on your tongue is the taste of your blood. Right? You're, in a way, tasting your saliva, which is influenced by your blood plasma and the chemicals uh, that your body's producing, hormones, metabolic waste products, etc., cetera, uh, blood sugar levels. You can actually um, have a lot of knowledge of that just through taste on your tongue. Now, um, your palate, uh, the back of your mouth, is it dry? You can take a deep breath in through your nose and consider is your uh, nasal passages dry, your throat, or even your lungs? Or do you have any tension in the shoulders um, or lung area? Is there any heaviness in the lung area? Any chest pain? Now you can go down a little bit lower. Consider where your rib cage meets your abdomen. Is there any tension there? After a long day of work, that's a common area of tension. And also, you may have been sitting down for a long time and need to create a little space there for your digestion. You might even notice that last, your last meal is somewhat sluggishly sitting there uh, if you've uh, recently eaten or if your digestion is slow. You can even ask yourself this question, where is your last meal in your digestive tract? Is it still in your stomach? 
Is it in your small intestine or your colon? You may not even know where some of those organs are. Um, uh, so your small intestine is generally around your uh, belly button and your, uh, and one area where people feel food is in the lower uh, right side of their abdomen where their cecum is. And, uh, and that's the beginning of the colon. And then the colon kind of makes a, does a border of your whole abdomen, kind of goes up, across, and down, um, and, uh, and then out of the body. So your lower left would be another area where you might feel, full, feel fullness if you haven't uh, had a bowel movement in a while. So those are all things we want to be aware of before we approach the question of food. Because if your digestion is sluggish or things are not moving, we're definitely going to uh, look at ingredients uh, to uh, remedy that. But we also want to uh, ask ourselves quest other questions, questions that go deeper in the body that you may not know how to even uh, answer yet. Like, how is your liver doing right now? How about your kidneys right now? Can you assess your kidneys? Can you feel the level of function in your liver? Well, if you were an Ayurveda practitioner, your answer to that would be yes, because that's what we study. That's what we try to understand. Your heart, you may be able to feel that. If you take a deep breath and hold your breath for a second, you might be able to feel a heartbeat and that can help you focus in on how well your heart is doing. And you can consider tension as you go down, tension in the, in the hips, tension, or really tension in the belly button area and the pubic bone area in, um, uh, uh, in the lower pelvic floor, in the, uh, in the thighs, in the, um, uh, in the calves. And also consider whether uh, your feet are hot or cold. It's still summer here in the Northern hemisphere. And so uh, many people won't be feeling cold right now, but you might feel a little extra heat, sweat in the armpits, things like that. We're gonna be paying attention to all those signs. Then we can look at our, uh, we can see how our skin feels, our emotions, and our levels of energy. All of these are great tools to help us choose food. One question that I wanna ask is, did you feel anything that, uh, that felt tense? Did you feel any sensations of fullness or emptiness? Did something feel jittery? And I just wanna ask that open-ended question that if you felt any of those things, um, what could you do to support that area? Would you massage it? Would you eat some food? Would you go for a walk? Get your circulation up, drink a glass of water. Think about simple tools, right? Let's not just jump to the herb or certainly not the pharmaceutical, right? Pharmaceuticals are great, but we're not gonna just take one uh, without considering deeply its effect on our body, right? Um, and so, uh, so yeah, consider just what, is there something simple you could do to correct uh, any imbalance that you experience. Let's remember that our goal in Ayurveda is to improve self-awareness. We don't study Ayurveda because Ayur, uh, for Ayurveda's sake. We study it um, uh, because of it presents a, itself as a practical tool. We all know that what we do at home between doctor visits matters, but we can't take the doctor home with us. So we need a paradigm or an approach that facilitates self-care. And, um, and Ayurveda was developed before we had modern testing equipment, before we had modern technology to, uh, to diagnose. And so that's Ayurveda's, uh, that prevent, uh, creates a great opportunity because we're not at a lab every day. We don't live our life at a lab. We live our life at home without those diagnostic tools. So we need to get great at using our five senses. We need something that's easy to understand for everybody, inexpensive, that's going to slash uh, health costs, that's simple enough that everyone can do it, that's effective, okay? So Ayurveda is not a list of remedies. It's not an esoteric list of which foods are good for your body and which ones aren't. It's actually a system to help you figure out what you need. 
to, have, to figure, help you figure out how to support your body. Now, sometimes you'll see on certain websites, and, and I don't like this, we never do it, but some people will say, oh, Ayurveda cured my cancer, right? I never talk like that with my clients. I think humility is so important in health. Uh, when you're talking to uh, a client in your clinic. Uh, but what Ayurveda can always do, no matter what the disease is, is support your body. That's why Ayurveda is a functional system of medicine. Um, and it has something really great to offer functional medicine uh, because it concentrates on how your body is functioning. So if you can improve your body's function, your body can heal the cancer. And that's Ayurveda's miracle, right? That that you participate in giving your body the strength it needs to do its job. And also to shift things sometimes. Our body uses general heuristics. Our body uses uh, general solutions, right? If you, if you bang your ankle, inflammation and swelling comes. Well, is the swelling always the right decision for your body? Not always. Sometimes uh, swelling causes more problems than it solves and we need to reduce swelling. So we hope our body makes the right choice each time it's injured, but often it does not. And so uh, we can also use the systematic tools of Ayurveda to, uh, in a way, shift our body's uh, focus and strategy um, and have it um, attack the problem from a new angle. So a lot of times what you see in Ayurveda in an advertisement or an ad is a beautiful woman on a massage table with flowers all around her and you know there's uh, massaging oils on her back and, and it's like a spa right and that's wonderful um but i like to think of ayurveda as a trip to home depot right what is it it's like you're dealing with blood and guts right you're dealing with the in innards of the body and uh, the result is beautiful right the result is uh is that it, it helps you be beautiful but along the way uh, we're uh, getting into our body and trying to figure out what's going on um, and come up with simple language to describe it and how to influence it. And it just so happens, this is no coincidence at all, but it just so happens that when you're eating food that's right for you, it happens to taste great, right? Because our body is, is, uh, is made to want what's going to help us. And, uh, and so... Um, it is uh, just a wonderful thing when you start to tune in your body. You'll, this will start happening, is that you'll go to the grocery store and you will, um, you know, you'll just see something and you'll be like, oh, that's what my body wants, right? And it'll just kind of light up and you'll feel uh, that it in your bones that you want to have some of that. You know, it could be a watermelon on the 4th of July and, um, and it could be an apple pie in October. You know, it could be... Uh, it could even be a bowl of ice cream sometimes, right? Your body just looks at it and you're like, I need what, what's in that. And, um, and we, you know, we're gonna start to put words to that so that you'll be able to describe exactly why and you'll be able to say, hey, wait a second. I feel that way about ice cream right now, but maybe you know, some almond butter and a date would be a better choice. Or maybe the ice cream is the right choice. Let's not, um, you know, let's not overlook uh, the uh, benefits of ice cream occasionally. <laughs> So one of the great things about Ayurveda's simple system is that you can do it yourself. In Chinese medicine, you don't go home and stick needles in yourself, right? You don't go to a practitioner and they teach you how to stick needles in your own body. No, that's not what you get um, with Chinese medicine. But with Ayurveda, you do get that. What you get is, a, um, is uh, education about how you can help yourself. And then you go home and do it. And I think that's the, what makes Ayurveda so unique and so wonderful is that you do it yourself at home and it's a system for that. It's not just ad hoc knowledge from 5,000 years ago, um, but a whole system and a whole approach. All right, great. So you figure out, you do some self-assessment you figure out what's wrong, and then you match that to things that help. And, um, and let me talk about how we do it, because that's going to show you how to cook, okay? So <laughs> I get this often in my clinic, is that a client will come in, and they have this litany of symptoms, you know, 20 plus symptoms, and they're all intense, you know, diabetes, and high blood pressure, and, 
you know, asthma and food allergies, systemic inflammation, you know, it's just the list goes on, right? And, um, and they're like, my health situation is so complicated. And they're taking many different pharmaceuticals, or sometimes they're taking 20 different supplements. I get clients that are like addicted to supplements and herbs. And it's it's mind boggling. And the clients are always wondering, where do I start? So how does uh, Ayurveda make sense of things? First thing I want to mention, and and this is the the most important thing, is that Ayurveda is category medicine. What Ayurveda does is it takes all of that complexity and it classifies it and groups it into categories. And here's the reason. Because the symptoms in our body are not um, separate from one another. In fact, they're related to each other. And oftentimes what I see in my clients is that uh, all the client's symptoms can be grouped into two or three categories. Maybe it's inflammation and all the things that are, they're reporting are, uh, have inflammation in common. Or it's, um, or it's uh, uh, more generally a heat condition where I see like irritability, inflammation, rashes. Um, and uh, uh, loose stools, right? All kind of go together and some signs of liver weakness. Well, I would classify that all under heat conditions. Or another client has mucus, lack of motivation, a heavy sleeper, and they're overweight, low metabolism. All those kind of go together. They all have a similarity to them. So Ayurveda, as Ayurveda, become experts at grouping things into categories so that we can simplify and, uh, and reduce all that complexity down to a few things uh, that we need to look at. And, that, and that's Ayurveda's way of, of stepping back and getting some perspective, right? Seeing the forest instead of the tree. So uh, these categories that we use in Ayurveda are very, very simple. I think you'll be like shocked that they're, how simple they are. Um, in fact, the, one of the biggest problems with Ayurveda, uh, or one of the biggest problems I think with people who are new to Ayurveda is that they overlook its simplicity and they want something more complicated and then they miss uh, the great genius of Ayurveda as a result. They want it to be, they want to feel like it's uh, something only an expert can do or there's something beyond their grasp uh, and, and, and that they need it to be uh, uh, beyond their grasp uh, to feel like it's special. No, what's special about Ayurveda is its simplicity. Um, so, uh, so what, you know, let, let's, let's just step back in a little bit. If it's a cold day, you put on a sweater, right? And if it's a hot day, you take it off. Well, if you have a heat condition in your body, you're going to eat cooling foods. But if you have a hot, uh, if you have a cold condition in your body, you're going to eat warming foods, right? If your metabolism is slow, you're going to warm up your body. So just as when you walk outside your door and put on a sweater on a cold day, that's the kind of actions that we're going to take with food. That level of simplicity is what we want to get to with food. Now, um, uh, and, and so I'm going to teach you the first eight categories to cook with. And if you cook with these eight categories, uh, you are going to um, uh, get very far with Ayurveda. Here they are. They're hot, cold, oily and dry, sharp and dull, and heavy and light. These are really simple. Hello. We all know what heavy foods are. We all know what light Hello. foods are. You Could you to... ask Dr. Eileen Brand to mute, please? We can't uh, hold hear on. you. Uh, let me, uh, let me, I'm just going to mute everybody. And um, Thank you so much. There we go. Okay, good. So, all right. Um, good. So there we go. A little uh, quieter and no more clicking sounds. Um, all right. So light foods, you know, celery, salads, heavy foods, ice cream, right? In fact, in Western medicine, you see people talking about heavy and light foods all the time. You might even see people talking about oily foods, like, oh, reduce the amount of oil that you eat, okay? But very rarely do you see Western medicine using the heating nature or cooling nature of foods uh, therapeutically. And that doctor never says, oh, you need to cool your body down with a cucumber. But we have these phrases in English, um, like cool as a cucumber, right? Uh, or we know chili peppers are hot. We say hot chili, right? 
Uh, and so we're aware of these properties of foods, but what we're not aware of is how to use them therapeutically or how to understand um, or, or even know when our body is showing heat signs. Okay? Great. So, you know, what we're used to hearing is, um, oh, you need omega-3 fatty acids. But if I were to ask people to raise their hand right now, how many people have experienced being hot or cold? Everyone will raise their hand. But if I ask people, how many people have experienced an omega-3 fatty acid? I think that is a, a, a very advanced question that few people could talk about at any great length. You might be able to say, oh, I had this experience. It's one sentence. But any good Ayurveda practitioner could talk to you for about three hours on all the different signs and uh, of, of heat conditions at various different depths. Oh, this is heat condition level one, level two, level three, level four, level five, level six, in each of the tissues of your body. And that would be a three hour discussion or a two day discussion or even a week long discussion. Um, and it's something so simple, centered around a very simple question that every single person can know. So I'm, I'm gonna just, uh, I'm gonna say that if you know the effects of an omega-3 fatty acid, that is awesome. If you've experienced that with your body, that is awesome. The library knowledge and the book knowledge is so important. But um, we also have to remember uh, to use common sense, right? We have to remember to look at the essential nature of different foods that we're, that we're uh, eating in these very simple terms, hot, cold, oily, dry, um, uh, sharp, dull, and um, heavy light. And then uh, just look at things from that simple lens and navigate uh, from that point of view. And you'll see the power of that as you start doing it. Okay, so it's not like a hot chili pepper is gonna heal you though, right? We all know this, we all know that it's like, it's not just you take one chili and call me in the morning, right? Nothing is that simple. What we're introducing is these different categories as habits. If you have a cold constitution, we're going to introduce heat from every angle we can, right? We are going to, you're gonna be dressing warmer. You're gonna be eating warmer foods. So you're gonna turn the thermostat up in your house. You are going to, um, uh, remember to walk on the sunny side of the street instead of the shady side of the street. You might even move to a warmer climate if you have that freedom. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create a whole lifestyle introducing that heat into your body. And that's what's going to heal you. It's living in a new way. And food is just the tip of the iceberg to that internal shift that's required in order to support your body in a great way. We all know that if you eat lots of heavy food, you gain weight. So we know that if we do something repetitively over and over again, it changes our nature. That's what we study in Ayurveda. You could almost say that Ayurveda is a theory of habit, that we look at different qualities in the person and we set up opposing qualities as a habit to balance it out. Here are the 20 therapeutic qualities. And you'll notice that on the left and the, and the right are opposites. Heavy is the opposite of light. Soft is the opposite of hard. Stable and mobile are opposites. So there are these 10 pairs of opposites that represent 20 therapeutic qualities in Ayurveda. If you drink coffee, who here wants to guess what quality um, gets aggravated in the body if you drink coffee? Anybody want to um, try to guess that? Okay, dry, sharp, good. Anything else? Mobile, yeah, caffeine mobilizes you. Coffee is warming, and the hot water in the coffee may be warming. I'm gonna say clear quality too, because it makes you poop, right? It clears out your bowels. 
heaviness? Well, that depends on how much cream and sugar you put in your coffee. If it just clears the bowels, it's actually lightening. Because if it stimulates your energy, uh, if it gets you moving and clears the bowels, uh, you're burning off calories and you're clearing the bowels. So I would say that it is light quality unless you add a bunch of heavy cream and sugar. So good, good, let's see, let's pick another food. How about popcorn? What do you think uh, are the qualities of popcorn? Dry, it's the immediate one, right? Dry, light, and rough. Someone's saying rough, good. Dry, light, and rough, exactly. Popcorn's a little bit of a diuretic. It's actually, okay, it's only oily, Mish, if you put a lot of butter on it. <laughs> Um, it's actually uh, uh, a bit of a uh, diuretic, and so it can lighten up, uh, lighten you up. And also, if you're not putting a bunch of butter on it, um, you, uh, it's going to be very filling. And so it's going to satisfy you for less calories. That's why it ends up being light, even though it's a grain. Okay. How about chocolate? What do you think chocolate is like? Chocolate's a little warm, yeah. It's a little mobile, it has some caffeine in it, yeah. Chocolate is bitter, yeah. Chocolate's also has this strange property of being relaxant too. It's a bit of a muscle relaxant as well as a uh, caffeine boost. You know, it's not jittery uh, in the same way that coffee is. So uh, it kind of, it can kind of ease tension a little bit. So I'm going to put it in the soft category, but also mobile. And that's an oddball because usually you get mobile and hard, right? Mobility creates tension. Uh, but somehow uh, chocolate is softening, especially for the lower abdomen. And that's why it's used um, if a woman is in labor. And uh, we need to relax all those muscles so the baby can come out. Um, chocolate is, is, was used for that in Mesoamerica, um, in you know, Central America, uh, ancient Central America. So uh, great. Uh, let's see, What's, what would be another one? Um, how about almonds? What are the properties of almonds? Anyone want to take a guess? And I'll say almonds without the skin, just to make it a little bit more um, specific. Dense, yes. Hard, almonds are hard, but they do not have a hardening effect on the body, um, Rachel. So, so basically um, after you chew them and digest them, um, they, they don't have an effect of, hard, of hardening. So I'm not gonna put them in the hard category. They're just hard to chew, okay? Let's see. So oily, yes, heavy, oily. Um, slimy, I, re, you, I use slimy for things like okra or oatmeal um, that are a little bit more mucilaginous or demulcent, it's called. I don't see almonds as being that demulcent, but they're oily, they're stable because they're satisfying. Uh, they're actually cooling as well. Um, and you'll have to take the skins off to know that. If the almond has the skin on it, there's a lot of tannic acids in the skin and you can feel this in your mouth. And this is the great, this is what you want to get into this habit. Put an almond in your mouth, hold it there for one minute. See how your mouth feels. You're going to learn a lot of things about an almond that way. Then take the skin off of an almond. You know how easy it is to do that? You um, put a little uh, centimeter of boiling water in, the, in a pot and you toss 10 almonds in there, boil it for literally 30 seconds and the skins will pop right off. You can squeeze the almond and pinch it and the almond will go flying across the room and the skin will come off. If you don't want to cook your food and you want the almond raw, you just soak it overnight and uh, then you can peel it off uh, in the morning, although it's a little harder that way. So the skin is bitter, as uh, Linda's saying, and the skin is also acidic. So it's gonna be hot and sharp. Um, and you'll really feel this if you drink the water uh, if you like soak almonds overnight and drink a little bit of the water, you'll see it's astringent, sharp, um, and, uh, and bitter, not very pleasant. So in Ayurveda, we like to take the skins off of almonds and then they become cooling, uh, stable, and um, heavy. 
and dense. Dense just means thickening in Ayurveda, thickens up your fluids, right? Some uh, people um, have very light, deficient, watery blood, watery mucus. You can tell by the mucus, really, is it watery or not? And, um, and they really need to thicken up their fluids to feel more satisfied as a person. And so we're going to introduce dense quality into the blood by increasing salt, fats, and sweetness in the blood and proteins. Salt, fat, sweet, and proteins will thicken up your blood. That will help you reduce fluid loss and, um, and help you stay more satisfied. So, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm riffing here a little bit of uh, just some interesting uh, uh, things to talk about. Uh, but let's, uh, let's move forward. So yeah, simple thing, right? You catch a cold. Well, a hot ginger tea warms a cold, right? We kind of, if a doctor tells you, oh, you have a cold, it should really be obvious what you need to do to treat it. Um, but doctors don't really call it a cold anymore. They call it a rhinovirus. And they say that it's a virus. But in the old days, we said it was a cold. Uh, what happened there, right? Why did the name change? Well, before the Civil War, uh, even Western medicine looked a lot more like Ayurveda. Remember, Western medicine comes from the Greek tradition, and the Greek and Ayurvedic tradition have a common root. They, uh, they actually both use this um, theory of habits as, like, re as in repetitive acts change the your nature. So if you do repetitive heating acts, you become more heating. Uh, so Western medicine had a lot of this language where they would call diseases a cold, or uh, they would, um, but these days it's called a rhinovirus. And, um, and so if it's a rhinovirus and I were to ask you, what do you do to fix it? You'll be like, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe some zinc to boost my immunity. Actually, a lot of people do know these days from st studying coronavirus, which is a respiratory illness, uh, not too different from uh, many co common colds. So we know zinc, uh, some elderberry to uh, improve the immune system. And then there's that whole controversy around hydroxychloroquine, uh, or uh, even if, if I even said that right. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, but in any case, it's book knowledge, right? How would you uh, fix a, com uh, uh, a rhinovirus? You kind of need to study it. But if a doctor told you, you have a cold, what do you fix it with? Well, you fix it with a hot. So right there, you can see that the old way of doing things is with opposites, Op opposite medicine. Ayurveda is opposite medicine, allopathic. Um, and actually, it's a funny thing. You can only catch a cold in the fall really in the, in the in the spring if you've got a rhinovirus you should call it a hot oh i caught a hot instead of caught a cold uh because in the spring uh you catch rhinoviruses due to congestive uh a congestive condition that's triggered by uh warming temperatures right when the weather's warming up your body releases a lot of fats from the skin that congests the blood which congests the respiratory system creates a buildup of mucus, and then you catch uh, what you what we say a cold, but really it's a hot. <laughs> you caught a hot because uh, heat triggered it. So uh, it's very interesting uh, that if you go back to pre-Civil War, you can see the old names of diseases, where diseases were named by adjectives instead of nouns. They were um, named by the feelings and uh, state of being that they induced, as opposed to being the infectious agent. Uh, so why did why did Western name medicine rename it the flu uh, or or a rhinovirus uh, instead of a cold? Well, uh, because Western medicine has antibiotics, right? If you have antibiotics, you name you know every system of medicine names the diseases uh, according to the tools they have. So if you have um, uh, things that can, can kill pathogenic organisms, you name diseases after the pathogenic organism. Or if you, uh, you know, are studying DNA, you're going to name the disease after the DNA, uh, the problem with the DNA. Um, but if you are an Ayurveda practitioner, you're going to name it after these adjectives. You're going to try to figure out the adjectives in the disease. And really what we are doing is we're renaming diseases as feelings. 
We're trying to get this inventory of all the different feelings that we have and make sense of them and interpret them and figure out patterns that are going on in our body that we can influence. Now, is this, um, you know, you, is this an either or? Do you do, you know, Western medicine or Ayurvedic medicine? No, you do Western medicine and Ayurvedic medicine. I tell you, when I'm sick, I use every single thing I can to get better. Now, some things make you feel better, but don't actually improve your health. Then I don't do it. I don't take, I don't take a pill to fix a headache. I never, I never take aspirin, no matter how bad my headache is, because I know in Ayurveda where, how, where headaches come from, and I have other tools, and I clear it out authentically instead of just masking the system, symptom. I clean it. I, I, I fix the cause, not the effect. So in Ayurveda, that's just why we start as a body scan. I started off today's talk as a body scan, as the prep for cooking, uh, the most important prep for cooking, because you're going to scan the, your body and see what kind of feelings are, what kind of pattern your body is in. A stressful day at work, really different than a cold, fall, damp day, really different than uh, a summer uh, tropical rain. And those are all different states of being that your body is in. Uh, different than a dry September day, right? Um, those are all different states of being that your body can be in. So you have to look at the experiences you're having internally and, uh, and then make, uh, make an inventory of what your experiences are, okay? So these qualities, I've said it already, heavy, light, sharp, dull, hot, cold, oily, dry, they are everywhere. And we introduce them in how we cook, how we dress, how we talk our body, our mind, our climate. Um, we, we look at diseases through that lens also. We, uh, we look at food through that lens. So a cold cucumber, a, a, a hot rash. Maybe I'll slice up some cucumber and put it on the rash. That feels great, by the way, if that ever happens to you. Okay? So, um, all right. So I've talked a lot about, about these uh, qualities. What about dosha? I just want to do a little shout out to dosha, vata, pitta, kapha. All those are, all those doshas are, is just a co the collection of, um, of these categories that seem to go together, right? When a person has dullness, they usually have heaviness and they also have oily quality. And we call that kapha. When a person is, uh, is cold, they're usually dry. Just think about your skin in winter, right? And when they're dry, uh, and when a person's really light and underweight, they're dry too. So cold, dry, and light is what we call vata. And if you're hot and oily and sharp, that's what we call pitta, because those tend to go together. So my teachers told me that doshas are, are, are like, um, you know, a pack of gunas that travel together. Think of like a pack of dogs, right? They're always together. Well, you have um, these qualities. I said gunas. Gunas are, is the Ayurveda word for qualities. I haven't introduced that word, but you have these qualities that always seem to go together like a pack, and that's all a dosha is. So let's not overcomplicate it. Let's not mystify it. One of uh, my pet peeves is, is when people make Ayurveda too hard by mystifying it. They're like, oh, Ayurveda is very special. It's mystical, all these things, um, instead of it just being a straightforward, wonderful tool that everybody can use. And, and that's the way um, I like to talk about it. So that's what a dosha is. Um, it's, uh, it's a very uh, uh, great innovation of Ayurveda, uh, how these qualities are similar and go together. And uh, I think such a great innovation. Well, let's just talk about some specific examples and then we'll get into how to put these together to make recipes. Let me see how far I've gotten here because I'm creating a, a um, uh, creating a uh, a foundation here, and then we'll go to some recipes. So I've got I got a few minutes left here. So cold, what does cold do in your body? It contracts, it dries you out, and it can also soothe, as in the cucumber on a rash. And here are two cooling ingredients: cucumber and cilantro. Heat, heat expands, it flushes and inflames. Think about a wine. What happens? You get a red neck. Think about chili pepper. It makes you sweat. Get your heart racing. Actually, it increases your heart rate. It dilates blood vessels. 
It flushes out your mucous membranes. It can incite a rash, irritates the liver, softens the stools. I could go on and on. Like I said, I can go on and on for three hours or three days talking about how heat affects the body. Um, oily. It nourishes, moisturizes, and also clogs. If you feel like you have an elephant sitting on your chest, that means your heart is tired trying to pump your blood. Probably means your blood is either congested or one of the, worse, one of the blood vessels in your heart uh, could be obstructed. Well, if you eat a piece of pizza that's very oily, you're going to really thicken up your blood. Is that what you want if you have obstructed vessels in your heart? No, right? So cheese, olive oil, um, you know, even uh, any, any kind of, you know, fatty fried food is going to uh, thicken up fluids. And, um, but it also is nourishing. So some, you know, for me, I uh, tend to have a little bit lighter blood, a little bit more on the deficient side blood. And man, when I, my, my wife, she cooks muffins for me on Saturday and Wednesday which is a very sweet uh, gift, of, uh, you know, loving gift she gives to me. And she, I, she always puts a little, you know, teaspoon of oil at the bottom of every muffin in the pan because she knows I like it. And it's very nourishing for my constitution. It's very good for me. Um, so I, uh, I, I love that she does that. Um, dry. Dry things absorb fluids. And dry causes aging, faster aging. And dry is harsh. And that's cranberry and celery. Now, if you have water retention, you need to absorb fluids and get rid of it. Um, and, but if you are a person who's already dried out, if you're a person who has dry skin and you eat cranberries, it's going to get worse, right? Heavy. Heavy stabilizes and strengthens, but unless you're obese, and then it kind of goes in the other direction, right? And it helps with growth. Um, my son, Henry Lawrence, was born uh, 10 days ago. Uh, he's a cutie pie. And... Uh, my, uh, my fi our fifth, <laughs> um, our second son, fifth child, uh, he's got lovely older sisters that dote on him. And, um, uh, but he's, you know, he is nursing right now and he's already gained two pounds, right? All of that, the, um, uh, heaviness, uh, from, uh, the milk is, uh, helping him grow quickly. Red meat and wheat also can strengthen someone and, um, and help them grow, especially if they're a warrior. I mean, think of, again, think of when Ayurveda was written, you know, people are out working in the fields, agricultural economy, uh, they need that red meat, they need that wheat in order to uh, survive. Um, well, in India, there's a lot of vegetarians too, so they get it through other ways also, uh, nuts and, and, and other foods. Um, anyway, um, light foods, they uh, cleanse and diminish. So a salad, we eat salad to lose weight. We also, all that fiber in the salad and the bitter taste helps flush the bowels. Uh, dull foods are pacifying, like cheese. It satisfies your stomach. You ever get the jitters because of something really stressed you out and you're like, oh, I'm gonna have a piece of cheese or a slice of pizza. And then that comfort food just settles down nicely in your stomach. Um, that could turn into emotional eating, right? It could be bad. But also sometimes it's just what the doctor ordered and we need discernment to find out when. So dull foods create that satisfying effect. It also increases mucus, right? If you have um, a sore throat and your throat is really dry, you, uh, you might, uh, in fact, this is why they include cinnamon and licorice in a lot of uh, throat coat teas because they're trying to introduce that dull mucusy uh, thing. And, and with cinnamon, you get the pungent aromatic cinnamon that opens up the lungs, gets the heart rate going, and it's the molten at the same time. And so what a unique property is that something is sharp and dull all at once makes it great for, uh, for colds and hot, uh, for, for, for dry sore throats. Um, so sharp irritates, flushes, and stimulates. And sometimes that's exactly what you want. You know, uh, uh, two years ago, I'll never forget the day, um, I was running late and I walked my kids to school. Uh, we live close to the school. And I was running late to pick up my daughter and I jumped right out of the house to a full sprint up the road. 
and I was like, yeah, I'm going to run, you know, I was feeling my oats and it was, uh, it was nice. And I was running up the road. Well, it was a cold day and I was panting by the time I got to the school and my lungs did not have enough time to adjust to that temperature. By the time I walked my daughter home, I could feel a knot of cold mucus in the center of my chest. And I was like, oh, that is a bad sign. I did not want to get sick that day. I went right in and I ate my, and I drank a very spicy black pepper tea with some turmeric. Turmeric invigorates the blood. Actually, I use a little Ayurveda secret called Trikatu, um, which has pipoli in it. That's a great low tonic uh, for a little added effect. But if I didn't have that, I would just use the black pepper. Um, and, uh, and I got right under the blankets. I warmed myself up under the blankets until I broke out in the sweat. And I knew that herb, pipoli, um, and black pepper would go right to the heart and to the lungs and purge out that cold knot in my chest. So, uh, so that was what I needed. I needed that sharp and I did not get sick. And I was grateful for that. And that is Ayurveda at its best is when you take uh, that opportunity in the moment to shift and aid your body in its moment of need. Okay. I also want to talk about tastes for a second. In our video, we have six tastes, but tastes are not just in the food. It's not just that the lemon tastes sour. In Ayurveda, we talk about taste as a state of being, a sour person. We know what these words mean. We use them in English, but for some reason, we don't talk about them therapeutically anymore. Well, we know what a sweet person is different than a sour person. A sour person is different than a bitter person. We call someone a salty dog that's different than calling them uh, astringent. And I'm not going to get into all the medicinal properties of these tastes, but I want to just, again, I'm giving you a, a taste of, uh, of the course um, in, in Ayurveda Digestion and Nutrition. And you can also find lots more information on the Joyful Belly website uh, to make this easy for you. Take the quizzes and you can uh, look at uh, what your doshas are and all of your uh, categories that are out of balance, all the gunas, all the qualities that are out of balance. And then you can download a free body chart on the website um, that will uh, identify uh, uh, causes that you may be doing uh, of those uh, imbalances. And it'll uh, match you up with food and ingredients uh, that are, uh, that, you know, it could be helpful for you. So go check that out uh, on the website. It's a free, you know, a free, very extensive body map, a very, very expensive Ayurvedic chart. Basically, it's your Ayurvedic chart. Um, and you can uh, give that to any Ayurvedic practitioner or really any holistic health uh, coach or, or anyone along those lines because uh, uh, it, it will give them so much information about you. And that's uh, really fascinating. Um, okay, so then um, we are, uh, here's some examples of the six tastes, but I want to, uh, let's see, Oop, where are we going, where, where happened here? So for some reason, there's some slides that aren't loading, but that's okay, it's not the one I'm looking for. Where is it? Oh, that was where the ones I'm looking for, but they're not loading. I don't know why they're not loading, so I'm just going to talk and you're not going to be able to see it, okay? Um, I'll put that on there because because it's uh, a prettier uh, slide. Um, but putting it all together as a recipe, okay? Uh, first of all, is you're you're going to choose your main ingredients in the meal, um, but then you're going to construct a sauce with the right amount of spiciness and sourness and all that kind of thing um, that uh, that will uh, make the food the qualities that you want. Um, and then you're uh, to make it individual for each dosha, because that was a question before the call tonight. So someone's asking, well, how do you make it individual for each dosha? What you're going to do is any you know, controversial um, ingredient like salt or oil um, or a sweetener or uh, spices or, um, or even drizzling oil over it, all that you're going to put is condiments on the table to let individuals influence and change uh, the uh, recipe according to their needs. So you put a little bit of salt, a little bit of oil in the recipe so that it tastes good, but then at the table, people have a lot of um, choice over 
what, uh, over how, um, you know, how they want, what they want to add to it. And then another tip for that is uh, portion uh, control. Like if you serve meatloaf, mashed potatoes in a salad, well, one person's going to hopefully eat a lot more salad uh, than mashed potatoes. And another person's going to have more mashed potatoes than salad, right? Um, and so you're, each person is going to choose according to portion. So, you know, you want to have a little bit of a variety on the table and you want to have those condiments out there. You can keep them out all the time. A little thing of olive oil, a little salt, a little pepper, um, and, uh, and a little bit of vinegar even, uh, so people could make their uh, soup a little more sour. Those kinds of things go a long way. So think about garnishes. Uh, so, okay, so you have your main ingredients, you have a sauce, you have your garnishes, and basically when you make the recipe, you're gonna make it as an herb formula. And in the course, I'm going to show you how to compose recipes, right? Today, we talked about the basic approach and the fundamental theory of how you would put together a recipe. But in our course, I review a composition, right? Like, how does Mozart sit down and make a song? Well, how do you sit down and make a recipe? Uh, well, you pay attention to these basic categories and the tastes in the food but then you're gonna choose some ingredients that target the organ you want. Remember I choose that pipoli before to target my lungs. So you're gonna choose uh, an ingredient. If you choose a, a beets, for example, it's gonna cleanse your liver. If you choose celery, it's going to uh, open up your circulation. If you choose mint, it's going to um, uh, also uh, open up circulation and particular stimulate the mind. So you're gonna pick one or two ingredients to go right to the organ that you want. And really your food is just a glorified herb formula. Now I can't teach you in you know, one hour uh, all of the different um, you know, uh, knowledge that you would need in a whole year long program, but I wanna at least give you the signpost and point you in the right direction so that you have uh, options. And then we could talk about all these different special foods. Look at, I have all these slides for special foods. And, um, and one day we're gonna get to uh, go through all those together. And then you see here, um, you know, just a, a short list of all the things that heavy does in the body, right? What are some symptoms, causes, et cetera. So I am going to, uh, I'm gonna put each of these up on the slide. You can hit pause when you see the recording and take a look at, uh, at these because we don't have time to talk about them and we can make this a, a, a 20 hour class or a, really a, a whole year class. All right, so I wanna open it up for questions in just a minute here. If you're interested in taking the digestion course, one, you can get that $350 discount. I know it's a big uh, decision to make for people to study a whole year and then you might have questions. So I put my cell phone number on the screen, text me your questions. And, uh, and basically if you register in the next three days, I'll apply that, that discount. It's $4,499 for a whole year long immersion course um, that is gonna be, you know, you're gonna learn like you learned today. So I wanna thank all of you for taking an interest in your body and health. And I know that it's not just about you, but it's about your communities too. So I just want to thank you for your interest in health because it helps humans. It helps people everywhere. That's a great thing. And I especially want to thank you for coming uh, to, to, to learn from me, you know, to, to hear um, Ayurveda from me. I, 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 I am, I'm passionate about food. I'm passionate about wellness and about bringing Ayurvedic insights uh, to you. And, um, and, you know, I'm excited that you gave me that opportunity. So, all right, well, with that, uh, let me open things up uh, for questions. Does, does anybody have any questions? You can unmute yourself. And if you are having trouble speaking, you can uh, always uh, put it in the chat box and well, I could try to unmute your line or you can just type in your question, okay? Can you repeat what you put in the sauce, please? Oh, it, what, can I repeat what I put in the sauce? Okay, well, the sauce is where I introduce the six tastes, right? Because, um, you know, if you're making, uh, you know, carrots and lentils, 
You're not going to have all six tastes. Lentils are astringent. Carrots are sweet. Uh, but where's your pungent? Where's your spiciness? Where's your um, sourness? Where's your sweet? Uh, well, carrots have the sweet. Uh, salty. There's no salty there. So you got to add a little salt too. So your sauce is where you make, is where you decide how much water in the recipe, right? And uh, is it a thick sauce, thin sauce, or, or, or is it just the, the, those things sprinkled on it? No, almost no sauce at all, right? Um, uh, so uh, you're gonna add your six tastes uh, to the sauce. And just remember, if a, here's the secret to delicious food. And I'm glad you guys hung on because I'm gonna give you a little nuggets like this um, if you hang on because we, we're, we're down 40, 40, 50 people left the call already. They're not going to get this because they left. <laughs> um, if you have few number of ingredients, right, like two or three basic ingredients, uh, one or two flavorful spices, and then you can add like things like black pepper to any recipe. It doesn't really have a taste, right? Some spices don't have a taste. And, um, and if, so if you have a, a few number of basic ingredients, and then one flavorful spice or two flavorful spices. And, um, and then um, your recipe doesn't come out good. Like if it doesn't taste good, it doesn't taste right. Uh, as long as it's not burnt or dried out or whatever, right? Or overcooked even. But if it doesn't taste right, it's usually a problem with not enough salt, not enough sweetener, or not enough oil, right? A little dab of oil or a little dab of salt, or just a little sweetener is what's gonna change it. Now this does not hold true for the one pot surprise. Some people make one pot surprises where they throw a bunch of foods they like in one pot and stir it around. That, you, there's no fix for that. But if you keep it simple, and as a chef, I always use Occam's razor, which means keep it simple, right? A few ingredients, two spices that uh, you, uh, and then a sweet, sour, salty, pungent, and bitter. Um, you know, not always a bitter, uh, depending on the recipe and the context. You know, I'm not gonna put bitter in dessert, for example. Um, I make my sauce with that, and if the recipe isn't good, it's usually a not enough sweet, sour, uh, not enough sweet or salty or oil. That's just uh, the way it is. So, okay, um, someone's asking, are we getting any recipes? I have thousands of recipes on Joyful Belly. Um, and uh, they're delicious and they're organized by dosha. I'm not going to give any specific recipes simply because it's different for every person. So I want to give you the understanding that you need to find uh, the right recipes that you want. So, uh, so great. Um, uh, Cynthia's asking, does Joyful Belly offer assistance? Our graduates are qualified uh, to meet uh, and discuss uh, these with you. So anyone um, who, uh, if you text me or email, uh, you can see my number here. If you're looking for a graduate, I will contact one of our graduates to get in touch with you and, um, and meet with you. Uh, so just text me or email and, uh, and let me know if you want to, uh, to talk with one of our graduates. Someone's asking, is fasting good? Well, great, great question. I'm going to answer this question generally. Ayurveda is always for who and when. Is fasting good if you've been throwing up for uh, a week and you, um, and you just recovered from illness and then you think, oh, I'm going to do a cleanse? No, you're probably already depleted and deficient. Is fasting um, good for 15 days to lose weight before your wedding? No. It's, it's a crash diet. Your body's going to think that you're entered a famine. Uh, um, you're going to end up attacking your thyroid as a result. Um, uh, your body's going to attack your thyroid and your metabolism rate is going to go way down and it's going to be much, much harder to lose weight. So I don't do fasting to lose weight at all. I don't, uh, um, but you can't, here's when I fast. When I feel, uh, like, especially in early December, <laughs> uh, when I, or, or uh, actually in throughout the spring as well, when I feel uh, very heavy and sluggish and, um, and it's because I, uh, I've been eating too many heavy foods or if I feel slightly nauseous, um, you know, even if I have a fever, 
I also uh, usually fast. And you have to be careful with fasting. Don't overdo it, right? Um, but I fast during those times. Why fast when you have a fever? Well, they say starve a cold. That's not quite right, actually. You want to starve a fever. Uh, you want to feed a cold, starve a fever, right? Because a fever is a sign that bacteria are proliferating in your blood and bacteria love sugar. If you starve the fever, your blood sugar levels drop and then it's easy for your body to fight off that bacteria because they get starved out of a foxhole. Mm. Um, and you feed a cold because cold is usually a sign of deficiency and it happens in the fall. Here's what happens in the fall. Temperature drops, your body starts putting fats in the blood I mean, uh, fats in your skin to thicken up the skin and help your body protect itself against the cold. And it pulls those fats from the blood. So your blood dries out and gets very thin and, um, and the mucus gets thin and it's, stop, and it's not able uh, to protect your sinuses. And so you feed a cold because that uh, thickens up the mucus a little bit and protects the sinuses. Uh, what are my thoughts on pro, pro... So fasting, first of all, it's neither good nor bad, right? We want to just stop looking at um, uh, things through such an oversimplified lens. Does good and bad exist? You bet, but it's often circumstantial, right? Uh, um, you know, what's good and bad for you or what's good and bad in general, whether we're talking about psychology or behavior or food or whatever, there are circumstances involved. Uh, we don't want to overcomplicate things, but we don't want to oversimplify either. So a lot of these diets like keto, uh, macrobiotics, um, you know, Atkins, all that kind of stuff, they're one size fits all approaches and they don't look at the circumstance of the individual. Ayurveda provides an umbrella and a foundation for you to analyze when those diets are appropriate. So, um, so basically, if you're a macrobiotics expert, you take Ayurveda to help you understand how to custom tailor macrobiotics for your client. Not that you're going to do Ayurveda or macrobiotics, but Ayurveda is the fundamental foundation that enables you to do macrobiotics well. And, uh, and that's how you want, same thing, blood type, same thing, right? All of these insights and wisdoms from other diets are pieces to the puzzle. Well, how do you put that together into a whole? How do you put that together into a rich, perspective-based, very human approachable system? That's what Ayurveda is. And that's Ayurveda's simple genius. That's very profound, but we could study it for 50 years. The course is only a year, but, um, but it's simple and profound. And that uh, is, is what, um, you know, it's what is, uh, is, is its beauty. So, uh, do alumni, uh, receive a discount on the items we sell on the website? Yes, Tracy. Uh, but we have discontinued all of our products, uh, to focus on the school because, well, the school's going well and our students need us. And I want to make sure every single student walks out of our school, um, you know, an expert and uh in what and what you do and that you feel great about it so we don't want distractions uh so i have uh we offer educational products on the website but that's it at this point um so great i see some other questions here too uh frequency of classes classes are we meet three times a week and you get uh, a pre-recorded uh presentation two pre-recorded presentations each week and, uh, and you get um, each week in those three classes, one of them's a case study, one of them we're discussing the lecture topic for the week, and the other is our body awareness and food experiments. Uh, we do, as a class, experimenting with food and the pharmaceutical effects, and that's a, such a fascinating part of the program. Everybody loves it. After one year of doing that together every single week, you will know food in a completely different way than you do now. Uh, so uh, yeah, we, we meet three times a week as a class and you have two presentations and a body awareness experiment each week. And, uh, and that is enough. <laughs> you're, 
it's going to be our courses are are cha are challenging but not hard not hard in the sense of difficult um but challenging in the sense that you know we're uh you're experiencing your body in a new way and it's an immersion and it's uh and you know you're going to be uh thinking about ayurveda night and day um and uh and so it's great it's going to be a great accomplishment uh when you're done so Good. Now I know I missed a lot of questions too. I'll take uh, I'll take another question if anyone has it. I have a question. Uh, I have heard that in Ayurveda, when you when you're eating, you have to eat the raw stuff first, and then wait thirty minutes and eating the cooked food. Is that okay? Um, I have uh, I have never heard that. Uh, that maybe um, maybe that's uh, something I overlooked, but it that also doesn't make sense to me to eat raw first and then cook, because usually you do it the other way around. You eat the easy to digest first and the hard to digest last. Now raw food tends to be more difficult to digest, but some raw foods are easier to digest, and so it's not going to be like every raw food before or after. It's easy to digest foods before more difficult to digest foods. Thank you. You're welcome. Jeffrey, we will talk about uh, gut resetting cleanses in the fall and springtime. The time commitment for week on the course is eight to 10 hours a week. Molasses is great for iron deficiency. So is sesame seeds and kale. And there's a good uh, product called Floridex but you have to be careful with Florida. It's, it's so good. It can actually cause iron poisoning, especially in children. I have a the question. six tastes help balance see. acne. They, uh, well, it depends on the person, right? What, what's your acne caused by? Is it caused by too much oils? If it, is it caused by, um, by not enough oils, right? Then your strategy is going to be totally different. You know, think about it this way. Suppose you are studying all night for an exam. You take the exam and the next day you have a long day at work and you skip a meal because you're stressed out and that, that night you catch a cold. Now that for that person, they caught a cold because they were deficient and run down. So for that person, I might, you know, I might say, hey, you need some rich food. You know, maybe you need um, uh, uh, a, a rich oily bowl of, of, of soup. Now take the example of another person. They went to a friend's birthday party. They had pizza and, uh, and ice cream cake. And then they went swimming in the pool on a cold day. And that night, a dampness developed in the lungs and thick mucus. Am I gonna tell that person to have an oily rich soup? No, I'm gonna tell them to fast overnight to get rid of their congestion. Same disease, exact opposite solution. Does that make sense? So, um, so that's important to, uh, to think about. It. Oh, can this course be helpful to someone who graduated as an Ayurvedic practitioner? Absolutely. Every year we get practitioners in this program that have been, uh, that have been uh, practicing for 10 years and they come out and they're like, wow, this totally deepened my uh, uh, level of Ayurveda. And in fact, we get many practitioners who do that. So yes, if you're an Ayurveda practitioner, the course is for you. We get gastroenterologists, uh, medical gastroenterologists in the course that have been studying for 25 years. In fact, every person in the course um, or one of the prerequisites for the course is that you have some kind of health and wellness uh, training or you can demonstrate a serious long-term interest in health and wellness. Um, it's, a, you know, it's a very professional group and um, uh, we don't have any uh, scholarships. Mish. The, uh, we have this $350 discount, but the fact is, is that uh, just for, for, for a year of study together, it's just so competitively priced that really the price is the scholarship. Um, you know, it's just, uh, yeah, and, uh, and that's, you know, that's just the best we can do. John is asking about uh, food combinations, proteins with starches and all that. Here's the thing, John, people with strong digestions can handle different types of ingredients in the same meal. As your digestion gets weaker and weaker, um, it becomes more and more important to eat foods alone. So, uh, you know, your body may have trouble digesting proteins and starches together. 
uh, but it depends. It really depends on the strength of your digestion. Uh, for most people, that's not a problem. Uh, great. So uh, homeopathy. Homeopathy is uh, wonderful. You know, uh, uh, homeopathy means treating with the same. Um, Ayurveda is treating with opposites. And they work well together. And there is some homeopathy in Ayurveda also, and in the general sense, not, not those little pills or anything, but just like there is use of similars. There are times in Ayurveda where we need sharp to get rid of sharp, where you need to fight fire with fire as opposed to fighting with ice. There is time for that. Smoothies, awesome, especially for people under a lot of stress. You know, like um, suppose I had a long day at work and, I, and I, then I had to do this talk at night, right? And I didn't have that much time for dinner. I'm not gonna eat like this difficult to digest uh, food. And then my brain is not available or there's not enough blood for my brain to function on the, on the call. So if that had happened to me, it didn't, I, I had a very restful day. Um, but if that had happened to me, I'd have a smoothie as my dinner because it's so much easier to digest and my system can clear it out. And then all my blood is ready is available for thinking and for being here for you. Cooking Ayurveda with essential oils. Okay, so you generally don't ingest essential oils unless you really know what you're doing um, uh, because it could create too much toxicity. They're just very concentrated. Uh, so I'm not gonna say no, but I'm just gonna say that's advanced. Uh, so probiotics are, are just to introduce healthy flora in your system. It's not necessarily gonna fix a white tongue um, on its own. You need to look at the underlying conditions as to how the flora got imbalanced in the first place. Heartburn. Heartburn can come from many different factors. Heartburn can come from a hiatal hernia, in which case that's a structural issue. And then I recommend going to a chiropractor and there are several great videos online for how to reset the position of your stomach to help your um, cardiac valve, uh, which is at the top of your stomach, um, uh, help that close properly. And, uh, and otherwise it could, otherwise, Acid reflux is usually a sign of diminished acids. Now, I know they give you antacids, which further deplete your acid. Uh, uh, and it's, you know, that's always very interesting to me because most acid reflux is due to too little acids, and then the food churns and sits in the stomach for too long and regurgitates. In that case, if the diminished acids are the cause, I recommend mint. But if hiatal hernia is the cause, mint is going to make it worse. So you just have to be careful and remember it's not one size fits all. Uh, we get, to, uh, Anne's asking uh, if they, she could take the car course from Australia. Yes, we stagger class times to accommodate every time zone. We actually get a lot of students from Australia, New Zealand, uh, and also um, other countries in the Pacific Rim. We get students uh, in, uh, in Europe as well and in uh, South America. So we have to make sure that our class times accommodate all time zones. Uh, so, and uh, we're, we're, we aim to uh, make the course accessible to you. Yes. So foods for stress-induced gastritis. I also have irritable bowel. All right, so irritable bowel is one of those things where it's many different patterns that can cre create or lead to, but you're saying stress-based. So the first thing I would do is, is show you Ayurveda's techniques for separating stress or to keep stress from attacking your gut, how to relax the gut and some deep exercises, body awareness and, uh, and also contraction and release exercises that you can use uh, to relax the gut on a much deeper level so that stress does not affect your digestion. That's where I would start, um, uh, and, and we teach that in our course. We teach that technique. Wow, you guys have kept me on the call for a while, um, and I appreciate that. I love great questions. I like sharing about this, and, um, and so uh, it's been a great opportunity. I am going to uh, uh, go now, though, so that you get your night back, and then I get to hang out with my 10-day-old uh, son, um, and, uh, maybe I'll even have a muffin because <laughs> my wife cooked them today. So 
I want to thank you all for being here. And, uh, and you guys are a great, great audience. Um, very special that you are interested in Ayurveda. Be in touch. You know, don't be shy. If you're interested in the course, text me and uh, we can talk. And have a, have a wonderful evening, everybody. Bye-bye.